Okay. So yeah, we can. It's kind of me backwards. Like, yeah, you're going to talk about the ancient yeah, stuff, and just general. And there's a fan down there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> Doug gave the example today of saving the useless thousands today. Yeah. I wonder if you know when Mitch Pink's in. Yeah. I'm like, what kind of car is that? Garmin. It's my bikini. <laughs> my Lambo. I'm right over here. But I've got one. Right? Like, there's some life chances. Yeah, life choice. You're like, what are you doing? Uh, yeah. 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 That's all that matters. Right? <laughs> well, for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another story. They need, a, they they need a financial advisor, but that's not my problem. <laughs> Let's not have this recorded though. Huh? Let's not have this recorded. Oh, this is recording. Yes, we're going to do some things, right? Yes. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for coming to the October KW Investor Group meeting. Uh, excited to introduce Scott Winklewitz today, who is going to be. Mitch is here. Talking about uh, apartment syndicate deals. Um, and he's going to talk for the first. Uh, 45 or so and we got Mitch as well I'm gonna make you a co-host um because really Mitch is the guy that makes the wheels turn um Scott's just kind of the, the pretty face um Mitch can you um just see if we're if we can hear you yep I can hear you can you guys hear me yeah I'll just turn the tv up a little bit awesome so um how about I introduce Scott and then Scott, if you want to introduce Mitch a little bit and then you do the primary of the talking sure. until you got to bounce and then Mitch, you'll be able to listen in and kind of take us home. Uh, we're going to end on time at two o'clock. So um, this is Scott Winklewitz. Uh, most of you probably know him as our preferred independent local insurance agent, and he runs a successful business there that he is then um, made the smart choice to invest in apartment syndicate deals. And we're going to learn um, more about what he's been up to. Uh, he spoke to this group last year. Um, so kind of interested to hear um, what the portfolio looks like now and kind of what the plans are for the future. And with that, I will turn it over to Scott. Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, so, Mitch, just to give you some background, I, we talked last year. I don't know how many people were in the room or not. Um, by no means am I an expert in this field. Do I know a lot? Yes, but there's a lot I don't know. Um, I have invested quite a bit. So, you know, that that is, I think, why I'm talking is because I have a lot of experience in it. Uh, but I just want to be up front that I'm by no means an expert. I think, Mitch, you'd have a couple of books that we could recommend along the way. But I'll just quickly introduce Mitch. I've known Mitch for, uh, I don't know, maybe five years now, four years, somewhere in that range. Uh, through uh, He's a Ball State guy, fellow Ball State guy. I um, actually went through a Tony Robbins event. And Mitch is the one that kind of introduced me to this style of investing um, with, I think, some books, correct, Mitch? And then um, 
and then just in introductions to various groups, et cetera. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. So Mitch, feel free to chime in. And sorry, I know it's not the best intro for you to make you look like the stud, but <laughs> feel free to go through your background as well. Yeah, I'd say a quick intro for myself, Mitch Miller. Um, live in Raleigh, North Carolina now, but uh, I'm an Indiana native. Grew up uh, in northern Indiana, spent about four years in Indianapolis. Um, yeah, so I got in real estate while I was living in Indiana. Um, built a portfolio of rentals that I manage myself. Uh, I still own a handful of those. Uh, I also choose Scott for my insurance broker. So, you know, we have something in common there. Um, and really what it was, is my focus was driving, you know, financial freedom for myself. What I realized is as I grew, um, it was kind of developing another job, right? Managing all these properties. And it really didn't seem scalable to go to the place where I wanted to go. And so that's where I fell into syndications and, you know, how I got started there. Um, since doing syndications, uh, I've done seven apartment deals. Um, I've done a couple funds. So I've done a mobile home fund and I've done an STR fund. Uh, so that's it. A quick STR intro. fund is short-term rental? Yes, sir. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Short-term rental. Okay. And Mitch, I'll kind of let you, any nitty gritty questions. Um, Mitch is smarter than I, so I'll let Mitch answer a lot of those. But um, just kind of on my background too. So I had a couple of Wall State rentals, three to be exact. I'm kind of similar to Mitch. You know, um, early on, it wasn't that big of a deal. And, and I was growing my insurance career, right? So it's like, okay, if I had a random call, it wasn't that, that deep, right? But as you guys know, as you start making more money, time is money, right? So when you got a call on a Saturday or you got a call on a Wednesday, it started to become more annoying and, you know, it started really t tackling, uh, taking away some of my time. So I actually sold to Ball State, I think, in either not exactly either 2017 or 2018 so i got some good money from selling those three rentals um the irr was well over 25 percent, maybe even 30 i was really trying to do some numbers before today um and that's when it was like okay what do you do with that money right you can either put it in the stock market which i didn't want to do um or you put it in other real estate right I, um and in fact mitch i think i think you obviously introduced me but I think I I um I was working out at F three and was working out with Tag uh, um Tag Birch one day, um, and he more or less you know just dumb luck. He's like, oh, this is what we do. So essentially, the, the nuts and bolts of syndications is for typically fifty thousand dollars or so. That is your investment. They give you a more or less a preferred return either monthly or quarterly, and then over a hold period of typically four to six years. They're hoping to drive an IRR of somewhere between 15 to 20 percent. That's kind of the very, very, very high level. So he told me that. I'm like, okay, this is cool. And, and, and you and you literally don't have to do anything, right? You, I mean, you give them the money and that's that's that, right? Mm -hmm. So like you do nothing, which there's pros and cons with that, right? You're not really in control, but if you trust the group. So I did that in 2018 with his group. Um, and I did multiple with his group. And then it's like, well, they only have so many deals, right? It's like, well, darn, how do you get other groups? And that's where Mitch has introduced me to some other people. So I'm probably involved with six or seven different groups. Um, and honestly, I am in oh, over probably 35 deals right now. Um, and I've had four exits, you know, since 2018. And that's kind of what I wanted to highlight. One of them was over 25%. That was an office deal. Um, and that was actually a two-year exit, so that was kind of quick. Um, and then all, another three all, all actually happened this year. One was 17%, another one was 34%, which was awesome, nice. yeah. and then another one was 18%. So, um, and, and I'll kind of bounce around, but um, any questions just initially, right? I, mean, I don't want to just blabble to blabble because like I said I'm by no means expert, but, but just any initial questions that anyone has on just the basics. So you had your money in for five years and your return was 17% or were there payments along the way too? Great question. So they prominent you typically, um, and Mitch chime in if you want, but typically on any particular deal, they'll do a projection, right? It's never exact, you know? So it's like more or less what they're saying is, hey, don't expect your money back right away. If we sell sooner, great. And they, I hate to say it, they could sell even later, but they're trying to give you a projection of, hey, a four to six year window. Some can be potentially longer. Um, yes, on my on my office deal, they were giving me an 8% pref um, on my 50,000. 
every quarter. So I was getting a check, a $1,000 check every quarter. Um, Hold on. Where's my check, Mitch? <laughs> it's on its way, right? No. In the mail. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> Well, and you say typically some deals you have to hold them for a year before they start making those distributions. That's so fair. That's, that's fair. Are you? Hell yeah! Look at me. I'm, <laughs> I'm playing. I'm in. I'm in the game, bro. Now, so Play. he's flush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so going back though, so some deals, and you have to every deal is different. Some deals will start spinning off right away. Other most will wait, right? Because you got to build up that cash. Because the other thing too is they're hopefully never going to ask you for more money. So if they distribute money too quick. And they need some money back, then they're in trouble. So sometimes the money's there, and they're just holding on to it because you just to be smart, essentially. But yeah, so they hit the pref, and then when they sell, um, that's where that's where that IRR comes in, and that's an annual number, not just a hey, over four years you made fifteen percent. It's you made fifteen percent every year. Every year, oh, okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Does that answer yeah, your question? Uh, now, now to stay on that path, and I think I've told uh, I know at least James in this room, Mitch probably knows this, and I think Doug does too. Uh, the one deal that had a 17% exit this year was technically the worst deal I've ever been in because they were not playing paying pref. Uh, they, you know, that's what they projected, but they just never paid pref. They messed up on some tax situation. Uh, which is still a head scratcher to me to this day, but they made up on their target goal of 15 to 20. So I guess that's the other thing too, is if you're really counting on that pref, you know, you would have probably been very upset because there was three years where I got no money, but you know, they made me whole at the end of the end. So at the end of it. So for me, it didn't really matter. They hit their pref short for preferred. Yes. Preferred return. Preferred yeah. return. And that. that basically means everybody's going to get a percent usually if it goes to plan everyone's going to get that and then after everyone gets that then you do like the 70 30 split yeah mitch you want to speak on that real quick yeah absolutely no that's that's spot on so preferred return is just a protect there for the limited partners people have put money in the deal um that number can be different right we've seen as low as five as high as ten um but typically we see around eight percent and that eight percent is is pretty much saying that you get the first 8% of profits. And so what Scott's saying is one of his deals didn't have 8% profit to give him. Um, that pref does like it accumulates, it doesn't compound, right? So let's say a deal only pays you 6% one year, the following year, they need to pay you 10%, right? They need to pay that 2% they didn't pay you for the first year plus the 8% for year two. And so you, you'll always be put first um, before the GPs get any dollars of the profit. And so, well, so Mitch just opened another can of worms. So I've always invested just as a limited partner, which is again, so the GPs are the people finding the deals, uh, sourcing the deals, lining up all the finances. What's and GP stand for? General partner. Um, so every general partner is typically anywhere from like 20 to 30% of the deal. And then the LPs are the other. Um, and that's kind of what Mitch is referring to there. So as an LP, that's what you get. So question, do... Do the GPs and the LPs all get their 8% first or the LPs get their 8% first and then you start cutting in the GPs? The second. Yeah, the, the second. second. The GPs don't get any preferred return. It, it let, if they're invested as an LP, then yes, they would. But in theory, correct, Mitch? Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah, we're, we're now kind of splitting hairs. Yeah, so I so with Scott the same way, every deal that me and Scott have done together, um, as GPs, we've also invested as LPs, right? We invest right beside our investors, you know, so we do get a preferred return, but it's on our limited partner shares, not our GPs. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Um, but a good question. Any other questions before we kind of go on to some other things? Um, Mitch, I don't have the, um, the two books, but one of them was what? The best investment, apartment investment deal ever. Um, and then what's the other one? Because that's what I recommended. And I don't know if anyone... If it's the same people there. James, you did you read one of them or neither of them? No. Okay. I listened to the best investment ever. Yeah, that's a great audio book. So if anyone's interested, and that's what I'm saying, you know, I'm disclosing that I'm not an expert, even though I have a lot of experience in this, that'll that will really make a lot of sense. It's a really good high-level audio book. The best apartment deal ever or the best investment. I'll well, send it out. There's, there's there's one to read and there's one audio and, and Mitch may have it or I can dig it up. I was trying to do it before I but I had some other stuff going on. But more or less, the, the thought behind this is you can do it in apartments, you can do it in storage, 
Mitch said even short-term rentals. I have it with um, industrial as well. But what they're doing is they're buying a property at maybe lower market rents. Um, they're almost like about like a house. They're flipping a house, right? They're buying an apartment, lower market rents. They're potentially doing some upgrades with the carpet, the paint, the appliances, et cetera. They're raising the rents and then they're turning around and selling it. So that's more or less the nuts and bolts typically of how this how the structure works. Um, did you want to chime in on that at all, Mitch? No, that's good. Okay. Um, so again, so some of these deals promise four years, some of them are six. And like I said, so I've already had four, four exits. Um, and I'm hopefully, you know, planning for several more here in the near future. But it's really just you know, I know this group's all about, you know, investors and how, how to make money, et cetera. It's, it's passive. I mean, it's truly passive to where you're not doing anything, right? I guess the, you could argue the downside is, yeah, you need to have a certain amount of money or you can't play ball, right? Um, and you have to hold it for a while, right? It's a little bit illiquid. So those are definitely negatives. But if you have the money and you can afford that timeline, there's a lot of pros. The other thing I would mention um, that I cannot do, which really frustrates me. Um, and Mitch, I don't know if you can do it, but everyone here in this room being a realtor, you guys, are, well, if you invest 50,000, they're going to do accelerated depreciation on the asset. And every time everything's different, right? So sometimes it could be, you know, half of your investment or sometimes more. So if you invest in 50,000, they may do an accelerated depreciation of 25 or 30,000 in that year one. As a non-real estate professional, I really can't take advantage of all of that. I can take advantage of some of that. Uh, but as a real estate professional, James, that's where, and Doug, after you guys have one full year into it, I'd be curious to see what your tax guy says, uh, type tax guy or gal, is there's a big benefit because you guys can write that off up front. Now, you may have to pay it back when the property sells, but it's just like anything else. You're deferring a lot of taxes up front. Uh, Mitch, do you want to chime in on that at all? Yeah. So for people that aren't real estate professionals, you know, we get that big deduction. We can only use that deduction against other passive income. And just to explain the three buckets of income, the IRS classifies active income, typically your W-2, things you work for. You have portfolio income, which are stocks and bonds, and you have passive income. And so this falls in that passive income bucket. So like Scott said, a lot of times, a lot of investors have a lot of carry forward. And so you don't lose it. It just carries forward to, you know, you use it. So we eventually mm -hmm. use that tax benefit. But the great thing about speaking to, you know, people like yourselves, like people that are realtors, um, you know, there's a tax designation called real estate professional. What that means is, you know, typically we're at like 50%, you know, give or take 10 to 10 to 20% around that of depreciation. So if you invest hundred thousand dollars, you're getting $50,000 of a paper loss, like depreciation, not really like, it's not like a hard loss. You get to write that off your active income as a real estate professional. So if you guys, you know, make $100,000, that 50 would come off your active income and you would pay, you know, that much less in taxes in that, that, that tax year. So it's a pretty powerful tool for a lot of our, you know, investors that are real estate professionals. And, and I would say that is if you classify the loss or the depreciation lumped in with all your other real estate activity and income. Is that the key? We're kind of like lumping in the commissions with this because we're a real estate professional. Like, I feel like the accountants, different accountants are going to have different risk thresholds for this to flow through at different levels. Is that accurate? Yeah, I would definitely, you know, have a conversation with your tax professional. Um, I would, you know, I just know that, you know, a lot of our real estate professionals you know, investors take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave it there, right? I don't want to yeah. get attacked. By yeah, I'm kind of with Mitch too, but I don't think it's, I mean, correct me wrong, Mitch, this, yeah, I don't think this is towing the line. It's That's pretty standard. I mean, you can just do it. I mean, period. Now, we're not, a, you know, again, consult with whoever, but you should certainly be able to find someone that would say, oh, yeah, this, this is by the book. You know what I mean? Like, this is 100%. Doug needs to make that up a little bit. What do you mean? <laughs> All right, that's fine. Well, you, got, you, got, you just did your first one this year, correct? and then you did one this year. Yeah. So I'll really be curious when you got you know you guys can speak best to because again I can't do it. I I always try to weasel around. Is there some way I can class myself for real estate? I can't. 
Uh, well, but there's well, other but things. Then you have to, then you have to sell. You have to show well, and then not in that, but so much of my, the majority of my income would come from insurance, so it's red flags galore. But in your guys' yeah. case, you couldn't do it. So, but um, those are yellow flags, not red. Well, <laughs> but either way, I'll be curious. You guys can speak to the group on that next year on what your experience was and how well that went. To Mitch's point, if you're able to write off fifty and you're in the twenty-five percent, let's say twenty-five percent tax bracket, I mean that's you're saving seven grand on. Just now, there. Mitch, are you doing a seg? Uh, what did I say, Todd? What segregation. segregation? Are you doing that? Yep, yeah, and that's where it comes from. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly touch on it. Um, so typically, a commercial property is depreciated over twenty-seven point five years, right? So ballpark four percent a year, right? If it's twenty-five years, what we do is we have an engineering company go in and bucket costs. So they'll look at the roof and you know say, hey, this roof's a ten-year roof, not a 30 year roof. So like we're going to depreciate it in 10 years. Um, and they bucket all these costs in different time frames, so we can accelerate that depreciation. And then um, some tax code that was passed a few years ago is called bonus depreciation. It pretty much says anything under seven years can be taken in year one. And so that's why if things are bucketed, anything that's less than seven years, we're able to give you that deduction year one. And that's why we see this massive uh, year one deduction on these investments. What does the cost say cost the GP or the whole entity to perform on what we would call like par for the course, like apartment building or commercial? I don't know the hard numbers. I know it's around 40 to 60 grand uh, for that engineering company to come in and take a look and bucket those costs. But they also stand behind you on an audit, right? So they're going to be there. Um, to help with any any questions the IRS might have, right? If they so so the fund is going to spend fifty grand, and then how? What are the massive? What's the ROI on that? Then it's already baked in, correct me if I'm wrong, right, Mitch? There. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is all part of our underwriting, right? So we do we do this on every property that we purchase. Um, but just to give you like round numbers, let's say a twenty million dollar deal, we typically have five million dollars put in. Um, you know, for down payment and CapEx. And so looking at half that, you're getting $2.5 million write off year one to our investors. Um, I think, I mean, I don't have like a hard number of ROI, but I think a lot of our investors get a lot of, of return from that tax savings. And then, so my, let's fast forward. I'm going to get a K1 from you at the end of the year. And then it's my job to apply that K1 to my personal tax situation. Yeah, situation. Yep, you'll get a K-1. And then depending on how you want to classify that, it'll go on a certain schedule. And depending on what schedule you put it on, your tax accountant will be able to um, help you take full advantage or carry it forward if you want to keep it passive and so forth. And I'll, I'll chime in. So and Doug's got a lot of great questions. And this is where I'll say I'm not the expert. Like, And this sounds terrible for me to say out loud. <laughs> like some of those... You know, like I, the best part about doing that is you don't have to worry about all that. Like they do it for you. So like some of my answers to that is like, who the hell cares? It's a great property. It's a great group. And you've read the, you know, the 20 page prospectus. It's like, they're just going to do, you just have to trust them and, and you move on. Right. So every one of these deals too, they're going to come out the slide deck that talks about the city it's in, the property it's in and exactly what they're going to do. Right. So like, um, and, and maybe Mitch, you can speak to this, but like the group you invest with is key. Right. A lot of it's about reputation, um, you know, because sometimes the deal can, you know, the deal looks great, but it's a bad group or it's a good group and it's bad, you know, whatever. It, it can go both ways, but there's all sorts of things that you can read through personally, um, you know, because there's been there's been time, you know, I've, I've looked at lots of deals and there's been a few that I've passed over. Uh, some of it's timing. Um, or some of it's like, yeah, I just, you know, what they're saying, I'm not like they're saying, oh, they're going to go raise rents X, Y, Z. And I don't like that part of, you know, I don't like that area per se, but none of this, it's not like it's a one page paper. Like, ah, oh, give me money. Right. It's like, you guys can really look through this and, you know, we're all adults and you can kind of make those decisions. And by all means, it's like, there's, there's deals that are better than others. Sometimes people just look at the numbers, right, Mitch. And it's like, typically if they're promising a really good return, either they're fluffing a little bit or it's a little riskier um, as again, because I, I have to go back like this, this one Gramercy with Virgin Hill that, that gave 34%. They certainly weren't projecting 34% when I invested. I think they are projecting somewhere between 15 or 20 and it went better, right? Like if you're seeing anyone, correct me if I'm wrong, Mitch, 
Um, if anyone's promising more than 20, I'd be a little cautious. Any comments on that, Mitch, or, or potentially no? No, that's a, that's a pretty good litmus test. You know, anything above 20 is kind of out of the standard deviation that we typically see. We see a lot of deals. Yeah, and it's and again, you want to you wanna under-promise, over-deliver, right? So it's like, even if they think they can hit it, you want to be careful, right? Um, and, and like I said, I've yet to have one under 15. Um, and even the Hilliard one that I didn't love that wasn't doing the distribution, they ended up making me whole again. So again, everyone's in different parts of their life, you know, as we're, as we're talking big picture and everything like that. I mean, one of my ultimate goals is, hey, how can I have enough money in these things that I can just live off the breath, right? And then when they sell, it's just icing on the cake, right? So you get, let's call it five or six million in these deals and you got an 8% breath, you know, you're making 400K a year, arguably doing nothing. And if you, and if you align with your tax guy the right way, a lot of it's tax free, you know? So when you, you look at that, that's really the equivalent to making five or 600 potentially more and not paying taxes on it. So that's kind of my thought and kind of why I've gotten into it long-term. What's really funny, you guys all know Jordan Moody. I mean, he just sold one of his rentals the other day and he was telling me, ah, oh, it just kind of became a nightmare essentially, right? And I, what I was telling him is like, that's my Ball State one too. If you can be super disciplined and take all the money you're making and save it properly, because like, look, eventually something is going to happen, right? You're going to have to replace something and if you already spent that money, you're taking it out of that investment. Now you have to dump more money back in. Whereas with these deals, again, they're managing all that for you. You know, you're not doing anything. You know, they're taking the Saturdays. You know, they have management companies that are taking the, every phone call that are doing everything. So um, I would say this, if you love being in control, you know, these deals may not be good, right? Because you don't have a lot of control. I've got a question for both of you guys. Going into, uh, I feel like with these syndications, they've been real successful in the past five years or so, a lot of it because they've been able to refinance. So going into a higher raise. Rent, rent, rent. What's that? And raise rent. Yeah. Right. Raise rent. But going into a higher rate situation, it seems like the refinancing is not going to be as much of a, a, an option. I'll let Mitch touch on that, but I would say, I'd say you're correct. And that's where they have to be a lot more dialed in on their numbers. So that's where I'd say the financing is even more of a bigger deal. If you're looking through a deal now and it doesn't have numbers on the financing, that'd be a huge concern, right? Of like, hey, what are you projecting the refi rate to be at? Whereas three years ago, it really didn't matter what they did because to your point, anyone can do that. Whereas now it's like, okay, you're saying this is going to refi in year three. What are you projecting that at? And they're saying, oh, we project that at 3% because rates are going to drop. That would be a concern. If they show that, hey, we're going to, we're projecting they to be potentially the same or slightly higher, then you could agree or disagree with that, right? Uh, Mitch, you probably have a lot more to talk about than that, right? No, no. I mean, that's a great question. It's something that we're definitely looking at. But I would say our saving grace, me and Scott, is we typically invest in like BC class value add. And so, you know, we come in with a business plan to add value. So think of it in more simple terms, like we're trying to flip the property, you know, so we're going in, we're refreshing the interiors, we're adding some amenities, and we're trying to raise rents to something in the market that we've seen that we feel like we can get to with the right, right amenities. And so we're coming in to really provide, like doing, like pulling levers that are manual to increase value. And so that leaves us the ability to still refinance. Now, right, the cash flow might be less, um, and to Scott's point, my number one thing I look at when I look at underwriting is, do they project things to get better or worse, right? And so when you look at it, like, do they expect cap rates to continue to compress? Well, that means they're, you know, that means they're thinking the world's going to get better. All the deals that me and Scott get in um, always have accelerators, so we expect the market to be worse than when we get in. Uh, but with those two things, I think you can mitigate some of that, and it's all in the buy, right? So that business plan is forward-looking. So when we purchase it, you know, we look at, like, hey, rates are going to be 6 7%. Like, does it even make sense to purchase this property? Is there enough levers we can pull? Is there enough, you know, income we can increase to make it work? And so it's a great question to ask, like the GPs of the deal, like if you're looking at one and it's something to keep in mind, especially in this environment. So looking forward, are you at all deterred or do you think that there will be more opportunities because of the shifting markets? Like, a lot of this group, we talk about single family houses. I would say I'm looking for more opportunities, more distressed properties. So are you thinking, hey, we're going to see more apartment complexes that are going to be available for sale? 
So we're going to use that to advantage, or are you taking a more defensive approach? Um, I'd say a little bit of both, right? Like we're looking for, obviously our, our deal standards have gone way up. So like we're looking for quote unquote better and better deals. Um, you know, there's, there's just so much going on in the environment. So like there's two things to pretty much everything I'm about to say, right? So we see, you know, the rent forevers group, you know, the millennials and people that have kind of started getting priced out of properties, right? There's more and more people, you know, there's been tons of surveys done that say they're just going to rent forever. And so we do see demand for apartments staying up or rentals staying up. Um, and that makes us bullish, um, you know, depending on where you think the, you know, the, the Fed's going to go in the short term, like the long term, they have projections of lowering. And so if we can find good deals now, as rates go down, we lock in a, a better rate. Um, and I don't want to go too deep, but like obviously we purchase these off of things called cap rates. And if interest rates are higher, right, that cap rate needs to be higher, right? Because we need to be able to support the debt service. Well, if rates drop, you know, everything gets better for us. We make a ton of profit. And so buying smartly in this kind of environment can really be beneficial for us and our investors, but we have to keep you know, that conservative underwriting and make sure that we're not banking that rates are going to, you know, fall in the next six months, right? But in a five-year time frame, you know, looking at what the, where the Fed's projecting, you know, we can, we can hopefully make some adjustments to our business plan to kind of produce cash flow during it, through that process, but also have a good exit at the end. So I got something to add to that. So with that being said, it sounds like you guys are, are, are looking for larger cap rates now, which means essentially a lower price for the same asset to get that return, right? Yep. So with that being said, is that going to, how negatively is that going to affect the exit strategies with properties that were bought in the last couple of years? Yeah, no, you're spot on. Yep. So that's the, that's the bad lever. Um, you know, everyone, is looking for higher cap rates, right? Because the debt service is so much higher with the loans. Um, again, I would say that our saving grace is we go in with value add properties. And so, you know, you'll, you'll see different syndicators, you know, some people want to buy a Miami condo on the water, a class property where really they're buying it. They're just hoping for the market to continue in that right direction, right? And that's where they make their money. Where, where me and Scott are investing, you know, are like I said, BC class properties where you're going in and, and adding value. And so, you know, we, we have levers to still increase the value of our properties. Now, is it the best thing for our properties that we purchased, you know, two years ago? Absolutely not, right? Okay. We're not going to sit here and tell you that this is perfect, you know, perfect scenario for us. But our saving grace is that we, we've went in with an opportunity to increase the value manually and not having to rely on the market to, to stay good, to, to make money. I was going to chime in too. So kind of, as I got introduced to the various groups, they, again, I, I invest with price a, a lot of groups now, is I was starting to try to bring, you know, like I was telling people about, I'm like, man, this is sweet. So I can get some, try to get some friends and family in. And I can't tell you how many times I'd have a friend or family member finally have enough courage and be like, all right, I'm going to do it. And then they email the group and it's like, sorry, we're full. And you know what I mean? And that, and like, so if anything, Mitch, I'd be, I'd be curious to see how, how quickly these groups continue to raise money because I mean, there was times where it's like man they'd send the slide deck and a day later they'd raise their money i'm thinking these people didn't even read the deal right but they're just going off a of reputation you know maybe the company or whatever um etc so so that would be interesting but but again and that's where kind of to come full circle that's where mitch and i have kind of gotten involved in the in the raising portion is we are like shoot our friend you know our friends and family are getting cut out um so eventually you know mitch uh, and with a group of his people that we've done some other deals with only his lps um and said hey if you guys can bring certain money to the table you know um so mitch and i well mitch more than me but i've on two properties been able to get a portion of the gp slice just by helping friends and families uh get in the deal um what's nice about that is friends and family didn't have the time um, typically a lot longer time, Mitch, um, than some of these other deals where it's like, you got, I mean, you more or less are, are forced to make a decision to figure out. Um, so I just want to kind of bring that kind of full circle. Like kind of that's, that's how Mitch and I, you know, like we got dug in on one deal. Um, and I think that's, or is there any other, can we cover any people that, that invested in that you're aware of? No, I mean, I was able to get one of my past client and friends who was interested in as well on the same one. Um, but I do think it's a value add 
for, you know, anybody here in the office who has the ability to do it or to then speak to a client and say, hey, let's look about diversifying your portfolio. It's real estate. I'm not directly involved with it. And yet this might be a good fit for you as part of a diversified portfolio. Yeah. So like after, and we'll get everybody links to the books, but like after you read the books, then it's like, okay, what groups do I want to invest with? And again, there's several here locally, you know, Virgin Hell, uh, Barrett, uh, Gray Capital is another one. Um, but again, it's all about timing too. And I think you did Virgin Hell. It's like sometimes, you know, Virgin Hell's getting ready to go to a fund model, right? Um, and fund models are becoming more and more popular, Mitch. Uh, where it's like there's still some places that are mis- investing in the individual deals where the fund model is they're like, hey, give us the money and trust us that we're going to go out and buy these good properties. So some people don't love the fund model because they don't get to pick and choose and read the deal per se. Uh, but on the other side, there's a big benefit to the general partners to have that because they have money at their disposal. So if they find a deal, they can act quick. Whereas the opposite is if they find a deal, then they got to make sure they have investors waiting behind the scenes to, to act quickly as well. If you don't have the investors act quickly, you're back at square one. And is your fund model, is your money invested in a specific property or is it more like a traditional fund where you might have your invest- 10 of your 50 or 100 invested in one and 10 in another one and another one? It's all, Mitch, can you speak to that? But it's my understanding that you're, you're yeah. equal across the board, correct on that, Mitch? Yeah, you're getting a yeah, yep. You're not you don't have individual exposure to any asset. It's like an index. And I think, and maybe you can speak to this, Mitch, too, is more and more groups are going like like Virgin Hell, for example. I know they're gonna go to a fund model here soon. Barrett already essentially has. I don't know if anyone's heard of Barrett here locally. Um Bam's going to Bam Bam is Barrett. Um Gray Capital, which is here locally, they are fun. Um, Napoli, but the other one I group I do with down south, they are not fun yet, but I think they're going that way. And again, that's all before all this market shift. So who knows if that's going to continue per se. So again, just getting down to the basics because we're going kind of deep into some of the weeds. But the basics is I would say is kind of reading the books, you know, deciding this is a, this is something you want to do, and then exploring the groups, right? And making sure, hey, do I have 50k? Do I want to tie it up? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because some of the groups too. Part of my frustration when I was referring people is, you know, I'm kind of grandfathered in, so I can still just do 50K on the deal if I want. Where other groups were saying, ah, if you're new, we want 75. Or if you're new, we want we want 100, right? And sometimes you can talk and negotiate with them a little bit, but at the end of the day, um, they're trying to get uh, the most amount of, you know, most amount of money from the least amount of people too, right? So it's uh, that's where this is kind of a fascinating, um, it's really fascinating because once you get introduced to it, it's like, wow, you know, how many people are, how come I never knew about this before, right? This has been going on forever. Um, and so it's just really intriguing to me. I'm, I'm super blessed that I found out about it in 2018. And, you know, barring something going crazy sideways, you know, this is kind of my personal plan, along with the stock market a little bit. But, um, you know, again, if you, if you look at the stock market, it's like, what's the stock market? You know, during COVID, it went awesome. But now we're back down to where, again, the last two to three years, I don't know, are we flat essentially? It's like definitely down this year. <laughs> no, but I'm saying historically. So it's, yeah. it's definitely down this year, but I'm saying yeah. two years ago. So it's like, so you've really made no money in two to three years. And we're in this investor group where it's like, all right, how can we invest our money? And it's like, it's cool. We're making a lot of money, but if you're not making money on the investments, you know, we're, we're just working hard for our money and nothing else. So, you know. Um, I have a couple questions. One, um, Mitch, when, when you're raising money, um, can you just kind of break that down and say, okay, we're trying to raise five million for a twenty million dollar purchase, and of that five million, X is going to be. Now you guys are you guys are saying GP for general partner. I was more thinking you were going to say sponsor. Are we getting away from the S word or is it synonymous? I think it's synonymous. Um, okay. Will you just kind of break down what that money out that money outflow at the beginning looks like? Yeah. So, you know, and if you give me a second, I can, you know, pull up like a capital stack of like where like the money comes in from and where it goes. So um, the largest portion is the down payment, right? So we get leverage on the property. Um, let's just say 20% of that, like $20 million property. Like, so 5 million um, would go to 
um, I guess 4 million would go to the down payment. We would maybe have 500,000 for CapEx, right? Where we're, you know, starting our renovations, we're doing that. Uh, we might have a little bit for a capital account. And then, you know, there is an acquisition fee for the sponsors or G GPs um, for finding the deal, for doing the underwriting, for doing the due diligence, you know, putting up the earnest money. There's all the th things that kind of go into that. Um, and so there's typically like a fee up front um, on that closing that gets paid. And so that's typically uh, about 2% of the, of the value of the property. And that's and just to chime in, not to interrupt you, but that's, if you read, the, if you listen to the audio, it'll go through that detail. Cause you know, it's me when I first started, it's like, it made sense. It's like, yeah, people are getting paid, but that's because they're doing all the work, right? Like they, they had to go through how many apartments to find one apartment that worked and then they got to pull on the trigger. So it's like, yeah, they're getting paid. And when you really do the numbers on it, it's like, they're not getting paid crazy, but they're getting paid their fair share. So when you read the books, it says, Hey, here's the normal range. Um, and that's, we'd also have to be careful when you read these funds is that there are groups that are greedy, right? It's like, wow, this is a little higher than the normal range. Like the Virgin Hills, for example, they control and now they control the entire GP slice, right? They don't need, they, they, they've got all the corners. So they take a hundred percent where there are some groups that they're like, Hey, we're great at finding the properties. Uh, but all of our current investors are now tapped out. We got a great property. We're willing to give a small percentage of the general partnership up so we can help get the money to go across the finish line. So when you read, when you read the book or listen to the audio, it will show you how they, how they slice it down on, on what some of those payments are. But some of those payments, they just go to, you know, BAM or Virgin Health because they do everything. Some of these other groups will outsource certain things based on strengths and weaknesses. Sorry, Mitch, you can go ahead. Yeah, and that's, that's pretty much where, the, where that initial capital goes. And we typically have loans that have like draws. So as we renovate the property, you know, we'll submit draws to the bank and get, you know, that replenished. So of that five million, what's what some examples of what the limited partner peon like me is like? How much money comes from my seat, and how much comes from the GP? So GPs typically don't put any money in the deal. It's like on a GP share. Now that asterisk is they invest as LPs in the deal. Um, typically, banks want to see a minimum of ten percent coming from the GPs. And so of that 5 million, at least 500,000 has to come from GP members, right? The banks, they don't want, you know, they want us to have skin in the game, right? If we're going to run the property, they want to make sure that we're invested. Um, and so I guess, does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess I thought that you were putting in GP money and LP money. Um, no, so GPs will put up earnest money. They'll do due diligence. So in a typical deal, you're looking at you know, one to 10%, I'm not probably not 10%, but like, you know, one to 5% of, of earnest money. So, you know, due diligence money, I forget what's in Indiana, in North Carolina, we have both, it's weird. Um, but, you know, we'll put up hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in, in what we call risk capital. So if we were to pull out of the deal and it didn't close, like we would lose that. Um, so there is outlays of cash from the GP, but investing like things that are long-term, um, the GPs would invest next to the LPs in the LP side. That makes sense. Though. Yeah, I just thought that you had. I thought it was GP money and LP money. It's all LP money, but then when all the money goes in, it goes to the LPs, different than it goes to the GPs. Correct. All right. Okay. I know we've, um, again, Mitch, you talked mainly of apartments. Like I said, I've done some industrial. Uh, so industrial, the numbers aren't as great, uh, as high a return. Um, and again, I'm no expert here, but the experts say essentially industrial is also a lot safer, right? So it's a lot, I don't know how you say that because nothing's guaranteed, but again, that's maybe not 15 to 20, but closer to 12 to 16, but a little less risky, right? Um, and then you have self-storage, uh, which is a really interesting space that I've kind of gotten in as well. Um, you could even do it. Mitch, are you in any mobile home parks? Uh, I'm, a, I'm in a mobile home fund. Yeah. Okay. Mobile home. And I am too. Um, but, it, but essentially apartments is typically, I would say, you know, what those books are based off of. Wouldn't you agree, Mitch? Typically is the, the class they talk the most on. Because at the end of the day, especially class B apartments, which aren't the nicest, right? But they're not <laughs> trash. People still have to live somewhere, right? You guys know how it is. If interest rates are going up on mortgages well, and then they can't buy, well, they have to keep renting. 
right? So it's kind of like people have to live somewhere. And that's kind of the basis behind a lot of this stuff. Is right. People book. don't have to go to the office anymore. Correct. They still got to lay their heads somewhere. Right. So that's why that the office things, and even though I did one, I had a great one, I'm in another one now, you, you could argue bigger offices are a lot riskier, right? Because that's potentially going away. Now, smaller offices, you can make the opposite. People are still going to need something to go into, right? The 2,000 square foot office or the 1,000 square foot office, but, you know, the big Chase Tower downtown you know, that might not be something that's lucrative because there's a lot of downside there. Um, 115, are you hard out? Yeah, I'm actually hard out. Okay, do you have any upcoming opportunities to invest in? I, I would I would defer to Mitch um, on that. Um, if you guys wanted to get included on a list or something, uh, reach out to myself or Mitch. Um, I, I know personally, I was hoping to do a friends and family, maybe fourth quarter or first quarter. But it also has to be the right deal, right? So I can't, that's the kind of thing, too, is it's all relative to the right deal and the right time. As Mitch said, there's a lot of stuff going on interest rate-wise. So I don't know. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Mitch more, but I would like to, but I don't know if there's going to be the right deal opportunity either. So that's kind of where, that's where I'll chime in at. But uh, Mitch, can you get the um, – or Doug, maybe yeah. – the, the, the two books is where I would start with everybody. I would not invest one dime without doing those books because I think it'll, it'll, the light bulbs will go off and you'll either love it or you'll hate it. And if you love it, you can go from that, right? Like those, those are going to go into a lot more detail uh, to the what we bought over. So cool. I appreciate awesome. your time. Thank you, Scott. Thank Sorry, you, Mitch, Scott. we're out of on you. No worries. Yeah, now it's the Mitch show. Yeah. Which means I get to ask more of the questions. So my first question is, are you bull and bear? Yes, I am. Okay. So you're bull and bear. That's cool. Um, that means that you started your own GP entity, more or less? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it, it's this is how the typical deal is structured, right? So, you know, whatever the asset is, right? If it's commercial, is it apartment? Is it a mobile home? We purchase it in an LLC, and then that LLC is owned by two other, owned by the LPs and by the and the GPs own shares of that. Um, and all my shares go into my business, my bull and bear business. So, it yes, it is I guess a GP thing, but it's a, just a small piece of pretty much every GP team that I work with. Uh, that makes sense. Um, do you want to pull up a? You want to go through a slide deck? of a recent deal that's either closed or one that you're looking at? Um, yeah, we can definitely go through a closed one. Um, just give me two seconds here to, to pull it up. Um, I mean, do you want to walk through the Pell City one? Yeah, let's do it. See, am I able to share my screen? Yep. So is everyone seeing this Pell City here? Yes, sir. Yep, so this is gonna just be an example of a typical uh, investment deck that we would send out to our investors. Um, you know, obviously this kind of header slide, you'll always see disclaimers saying, hey, look, you know, we're looking at a five-year business plan. You know, these are projections, right? Things will be different. You know, no one can predict what's gonna go on in the future. Um, here we can kind of see a, a quick summary of, of the deal, right? We see it's a $15.6 million deal. Um, you very quickly see, you know, what kind of deal structure it is. We can see we have an 8% pref return. Uh, we have a 70, 30 split. And then here are the projections, right? We see a 10.6% average cash on cash return, um, with a total of turn of 136% over, over six years. And so here's that IRR number, um, and then your equity multiple. So this is again, just like the highlight, you know, where we're going. As we go down, we'll start to see the team, right? So this is our sponsor team or what I call leads. Um, so a lot of people think of GPs like one person. So me and Scott never run a deal by ourselves. Uh, we're just pieces of the team. And so these are the, the, what I call the leads, right? So these are the, they're one company, uh, they're premium cash flows, their company. 
Um, and they found the deal, they did the underwriting, right? They do most of the due diligence. And so, you know, they're gonna manage this deal and this deal flow. So kind of here you can see their experience and how much they have under assets. So uh, those, those are the GPs? Well, so me and Scott are also GPs, but they're what I call leads. And so they're gonna be the people that are like managing the asset. Um, you know, we are on calls, we help with decisions, but they're at the end of the day, they're the decision makers. Okay, and they're the ones who on this next slide, they did the research on why Pell City is the auto capital of the South. Yep, <laughs> yeah, they, they did most of this, you know, a lot like I help with this as well. Like I'll dive in and look at, you know, Bureau, you know, Bureau of Labor statistics and things like that. Like we all help out with the slide deck, but the bulk of this is from them. And how much time from at the GP level has gone into this type of analysis as to why Birmingham is an MSA that you're interested in? Months. Um, you know, we all have, so like for, for me, myself, and the teams that we work with, like we really think the Southeast is really somewhere we want to focus on. Um, you know, we think it's landlord friendly. We think taxes are good. It's business friendly states. It's landlord friendly states. People are moving there, um, especially now with remote work, right? People just want better climates. Um, and so a lot of us like the South and Southeast. Um, once we've narrowed that down, we look at only cities that have, you know, growing populations, have job growth. You know, we see, you know, conditions, you know, that relate to rentals, you know, going in the right direction. And so, you know, that narrows it down to just a handful of places. And you want places that have, you know, a decent amount of population. Like you never want to, typically you don't want to buy in a population that has, you know, you know, 30,000 people, right? Because if there's typically, you know, a few footholds there, like, a, you know, one job, you know, employer, or one, you know, one critical piece that if that goes away, like you're kind of in a world of hurt. Like you want something that's fairly big and, and has some job and, and employment growth there. And just to be in alignment with that, the other two, I think, on your website I've seen were Oklahoma City and Waco, Texas. Yep. And, and does, that, does that fall within what you just kind of spoke to? Yep. So, you know, we, we yeah, we really try to align, keep that the same across the board. There should be a Dallas Fort Worth on there as well. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, so now we're just kind of, like, you know, like we're talking about, we're kind of going into why we like the area, you know, some of the highlights of the area. Here we can see, you know, a couple of the key points that we look at. You know, we see population, we see rent growth. You know, why do we think this market's a good market to invest in? Um, and, and really the cool thing about us is, you know, we do all this research and you can go and, and dive in yourself and verify or fact check or go do these things. Like this is, you know, we're trying to do all the legwork, but this is definitely one of those things where if you're going to park your hard earned money that, you know, you trust but verify. Um, you know, here, like I said, you know, we looked at the top employers, you know, making sure that, you know, there's a diverse, you know, employment there. So if something leaves, like we're not, you know, in a bad situation. Here we see some accolades on why Birmingham is a great place to invest. Um, and once we go through all that, right, we look at the property. So here we can see how many units it is, the average square feet, you know, how many buildings the style. Uh, and then- So how, how did they find this property? Yeah, so this one, it's funny. So as realtors, you know that, you know, you probably have a little bit of a competition with like Zillow and Redfin, like people can kind of do some searching and look at what's for sale without necessarily a realtor these days on the residential side. Um, on the commercial side, it's still a little bit old school. And so, you know, we work with brokers that, you know, have, you know, a good standing with a lot of people. And there's a lot more things called, well, you guys know what pocket listings are. There's a lot more pocket listings in commercial real estate. And so this was actually found from a broker. Um, this was a mom and pop um, ownership. And so they, they purchased it, you know, a, a long time ago and they ran it and they wanted to sell prior to COVID. And so they were actually renovating the units in like 2019 and raising or going to planning on raising rents to sell it. And when COVID happened, they froze and they just wanted to keep occupancy. And so they signed a lot of two-year leases um, in 2019 and 2020. And so they did a lot of the, of the facelifts, but they never raised rents because they were worried about occupancy and payments. So we got to find it. We thought it was a great deal. Um, you know, rents were well below market rents for the area. Uh, I think there's a slide in here that shows that. Um, and yeah, the mom and pop just wanted out. And so that's kind of how we found it. It was a pocket listing. Um, just talk with the owner and 
you know, came to terms. I got a question there, and I think you just brushed on it because I was going to ask you. You said you guys like to do the value add, and I think it was on the slide on is either page two or three. You said it was 95% occupied, and they renovated them in 2019. So is the value add uh, basically just uh, raising the rents? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, when you – yeah, that's exactly right. Um, <clears throat> and really, we saw it as an advantage. Uh, because a lot, right now, labor and supply chain are still an issue for a lot of things. Um, on our Waco deal, we're six months behind on dishwashers. It was this was kind of like a slam dunk, then, right? Um, I don't like using that term, but yeah, it, that's why we like this deal, right? Because they did a lot of the heavy lifting. They just didn't take any reward from it. And so we're able to step in, just manage it better, yeah, right? Have a professional good. team there. Yeah. <laughs> all right yeah let's keep going through the side deck here sir yeah and i'll, I'll speed up here because i mean we're kind of getting the weeds but really we're just giving high levels again you know why we're like in the area um we talk to the city and the metro and you know there's no one that has applied to make any new apartments so we you know i think for five years i think this was talked about they need like a five-year runway to build anything very large like a, probably a certain zoning and nothing was been submitted. So we know that there's no new supply coming on at any large scale for five years. Um, and I thought that I thought that was a great nugget that you said, yeah, basically, hey, yeah. there's gonna be limited options. We're not we're not gonna see something across the street. So that's something that caught my eye. Yep. Um, you know, here we start to see we're two hundred dollars below market rent. You know, we've seen great gro uh, rent growth in the area. Um, kind of talking our amenities, right? There's a housing shortage. You'll typically see this, right? You know, where's the property at? What what are amenities are around it? Like you want to make sure you're not, and I think they call it like a, a like a, I'm gonna call it a grocery desert where there's like there's no options to go grocery shopping or any food options, um, you know, around. So this is just always good to see kind of like, are you in a, a high commerce area? Is this where people want to live? Is this, you know, ease? Like if you, can you see yourself living here? You know, maybe not the class, but like, hey, it's close to a Walmart. It's close to some 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 food and things like that. Like, it is a place people want to live. Um, here are the business plans, right? So again, we're gonna kind of go over some renovations on the interior. Like we said, it's gonna be light because they already did a lot of the turns for us, which is awesome. Um, outside, we're gonna resurface the pool, kind of take care of the outside amenities, make it a place that we want. You know, that our parents are gonna be proud to live at. Um, it's something that I never saw a lot of value in until. I visited my first property and just seeing the people that kind of lived in a place that wasn't managed as well. So this is actually a pretty nicely managed property, but some of the properties we go in are more traditionally um, unkept. And so going and just resealing the parking lot and adding a playground, you know, seeing people having pride where they live is pretty rewarding. And it also obviously keeps tenants there. It keeps them renewing. Obviously it's cheaper to have someone renew their lease than it is to have them move out and do a turn. Um, so just a lot of great things there. What's the, um, what's the breakdown of like, the GP figuring out who's going to resurface the pool versus like the local property manager. Um, like who finds the the vendor or who decides? What yeah, because like like how does that broken down from like hey, local people, you're in charge of like these vendors, but like if it's a bigger project or something at a certain scale. <laughs> <laughs> then where does that fall under your responsibility or the key sponsors? Yeah. So it's typically maintenance is going to be handled by like that property manager. Right. So like break fix stuff, you know, so if a washer breaks, like they're going to have a, a appliance guy that's going to come out and take a look at it. Right. If the leaky faucet, like we have maintenance staff that goes out and takes care of that. I think where the line's drawn is like CapEx. So like, Hey, we're going to go do like a, you know, a hundred thousand dollar resurfacing project on the parking lot, or we're going to add stuff to the pool, right? So I think those are the lines between maintenance and capex is really where that's probably delineated. Good answer. Um, here's just the, uh, some additional details, right? So we see here how many are one ones, how many are two twos, two threes. Um, the really cool thing here is we've have a couple townhomes on the property, and the biggest one I think is a three three it was like three thousand square feet and we were giving it to a maintenance guy for well we weren't the previous owners were giving it to a maintenance person for free um rental comps in the area for three thousand square feet is like twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars 
Um, and so that's something we could go into and just initially just raise $3,000 right off the bat. So stuff like that, operational things too, you know, there's places we can add value. And so that was a pretty cool little add to our, to our group. Um, this is just walking over like why we picked this property manager. So we have full-time on staff leasing agents and we have a couple of handymen that are on staff. This is kind of just going through, you know, multi-south, like why we picked them. Here again is the pl interior plans, you know, within 18 months, we hope to turn the rest of the units um, that aren't turned or, or do light flips in the ones that are. Um, this is a big one that our group does that I don't see a lot of other groups do. A lot of older properties have one water main line comes in and they, uh, and they don't like, we, they don't sub meter, right? And so we step in, you know, if there's not a rubs program, which is a ratio utility billing system, like, so a one bedroom pays 20 bucks a month, a two bedroom pays 30 bucks, that type of thing, just flat fees. We'll institute that, but we'll also come in and do low flow, like shower heads, toilets, sinks, and faucets to kind of help cut down on that water. So not only are we charging back a little bit for it, but we also get to cut the bill by about 40% by doing these water conservation projects. And anything that we save on the bottom line is profit, right? So even if we weren't to do a rub, so like we're saving, you know, 40% on our water bill every month just by doing that. And so just cool things like that, that we do that are outside the box. And that's kind of what, why the team of experts and the GPs, you know, you know, provide that value that they do. What, um, so ideally every unit is sub metered. That's ideal, right? Where I'm in unit 10 a and I get my water bill for 10 a. Yeah. And how many, how many of, of the, of the bull and bear ones, have you had to do one where you tried to convert from one like master bill to unit specific? We've never done that. Uh, it's just cost inefficient to go in and truly add sub meters and have the city come out or the water company come out and, and do that at a large scale. Um, and so what we do is we end up kind of making money on it in a sense where, you know, we buy it with a hundred percent ownership of that bill. And so like, like without going into details, right. That's an expense that we get to write off the purchase price. Um, and if we get to come in and start doing rubs and start doing water conservation, right. We add a ton of value by doing that. And for us, it makes more sense to do that than to pay the large fee to have it come out and be truly submetered. So you say, oh, I have to pay this big water bill and then you make it less. Yep, that's exactly right. Like we're, we're cutting an expense. And so by doing that, we're saving dollars. It's added to our profit. Got it. So what's a, what, uh, what you call a bull and a bear? I don't understand that. That's, that's it. That's like his Zulu. He's, he, his Zulu group is bull and bear. Oh, okay. Got it. And then, hey, Mitch, I've got a couple of questions. Yeah. So, logistically, when do you renovate the units? Is it when you have turnover, or do you do it when they're, you wouldn't do it when the people are living in the units, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's, it's, it's a, it's a song and dance for sure. Um, typically, we do renovate the easy ones first, so the vacant units are where we start. Um, and then turns, right? So, you know, being an apartment building, we have leases that come up pretty much every month. And so in a perfect world, right, we would move tenants like, hey, like, hey, I want to renew. That's awesome. Let's move you to a renovated unit. Like you can't stay in this one, right? Um, we sometimes can push like, hey, like, okay, we won't have you move this time. We'll, we'll save your unit. Um, and then just try to like, but you do eventually, you need a couple every month. So typically in this property, I think we're doing five to seven a month. And so you need to make sure that you have, you know, those open and ready to go. Yeah, you don't do it while people are there uh, because you're, you know, you're turning out cabinets and then redoing bathrooms and things like that. It's just pretty disruptive for, you know, anyone that's going to live there to kind of live through that. So you're, you're purposely not going to lease a freshly renovated unit necessarily you may keep that offline to move someone that's already renting into that one? I don't know if we would take a, like, say that. Um, it, I'll just say that there's a lot of, like, maneuvering going on, right? So, like, we do pre-leases to kind of help with that. So, to your point, like, we might wait three weeks to put someone there, you know, because, you know, a lot of times we need 60 days notice to know if you're going to re renew your lease or if you're going to move. 
And if you say, hey, I want to stay, right, that gives us time to kind of move and adjust and, and be flexible. I'm like, hey, great. On this day, like, you're going to move to this unit, though. And it's going to be renovated. And, you know, you have all these new amenities. Um, oh, and by the way, it's higher rent. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a conversation that I'm happy I don't have to have. But, you know, that is part of the process, right, is, is we are adding amenities and trying to make it a better place to live. And, and that does come with, with market rents. Sure. Do you typically give them the option to say, if they don't want to do that, say, uh, to let them stay where they're at at the, at the current rent or a rent at a smaller increase? So there is options like that. Um, so we typically do 90% or 95% of the units. We leave, we always leave some classic units um, that on renovated. And that's kind of, again, going back to like a syndicator, like what kind of due diligence you want to do on the team you work with. Because the first time I did it, I was like, why are we not flipping 100% of the units? You know, why are we leaving, you know, meat on the bone? Like, let's, you know, we're leaving profits there. And they said pretty much anyone that buys a $15 million deal are other investors, right? There's not, there's very rarely a mom and pop that's trying to buy something that they want to yield, you know, 4% unlevered or 7% unlevered, right? Um, so if you squeeze all the juice out of it, it's going to sit on the market a long time before like an investor can come in and buy it, right? Because there's just really not much they can do for it if it's already like a fully performing asset. And so because of that, going back to your question, there are times where if like there's a you know, situation or maybe a really good tenant, or I don't know how they do it. I'm not a part of the leasing office there, but there are people that we do leave in classical units. Um, but yeah, we would slowly start bumping the rents up as well. It just wouldn't be as much as like a fully renovated unit. That was a long answer to your question, but. No, that was good insight. I have a real simple one. What are rubs? Yeah, rubs is a ratio utility billing system. And so like a one bedroom would get charged like a flat fee, like it's 20 bucks for a one bedroom for water every month. Um, because they're not submetered, it's just a way to kind of help collect and, and kind of negate some of that cost. Do you have more questions, Steve? Um, I, so typically how many tenants when you raise the rate in a particular property don't renew? I don't have an answer. Um, I, I I'll say I was surprised at how many people were okay with moving up in rents. Um, because a lot of times it's not just like we come in like, hey, guess what? Rents are $200 more. It's, you know, we went in and put nice countertops and, and a dishwasher and they now have a pool they can use. And, you know, we've added playground. And we've, you know, we made the place so much better that like it's it's truly like an like a win win right they're 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 proud they see the advancements they see the 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 growth in the property um or the betterment of the property and they're typically happy to pay i shouldn't say happy but we don't have a lot of people it's like we have a mass exodus on all of our properties like it's a lot of people stay got it all right let's keep moving here mitch yeah and so that's the answer this is the exterior, right? Just kind of some high level stuff that we plan on doing adding a dog park. Ooh, tell me about the LEDs though. Are you doing an electricity conservation project just like you are water? Um, I, it wasn't part of our uh, underwriting. So I don't know if it's a huge savings on that side. I think it's just um, brighter, longer lasting. Like it's almost more like a, a long-term maintenance thing. Okay. You know, LEDs last longer. Gotcha. Dog park? What do you know about the dog park? Uh, not much. Just that, you know, with dog parks come dogs, which comes pet fees, which comes increased revenue. So are you pro <laughs> are you pro pet then? So you can charge that extra dollars is what I'm hearing? Yeah, I mean, we have limits on on pets, right? So we have limit of number, but also size. And so we've, you know, we've have a lot of expertise in the area that let's say, you know, small, medium dogs, you know, aren't that bad on the property. Um, typically makes people stay longer. They pay higher rents. They, they pay pet fees. What's um, your pet fee? And for this property, it's thirty dollars a month. Okay. Cool. Yep. Yeah, so this. What? Can I just fess up to it being them side conversation? How much is the pet fee? Thirty. Thirty. Mine's twenty-five for a single family. For one, 40 for two. All right. I'm curious about this. Who who did all the legwork to figure out market rents? Uh, it would be the sponsor team. So they, they went in, they looked at rents, they looked at averages. Um, I can see if I can dig up the due diligence or like the underwriting. 
but yeah, we get to go in and, and typically we see this with, with uh, like, it'll break it down by units, like one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, um, because it's off of square footage. Um, this might just be a, a kind of average across the board here, but yeah, what we can see is Pell City, uh, the property we purchased here, uh, Park on 23rd is the lowest in the, in the, in the range here. And so we see just a lot of room for us to grow the rents and, and see where we're going. Um, so so this like, were be, you, were you responsible for determining the river house was a dollar 23? Was I personally, or was our team? You personally? No. Did you guys break it up and five of you, everyone gets one or you, you all do it? your own study and then you like blend it or what? No, it's all, we all do it in one file. Um, I don't, I just can't tell you who exactly on the team went and found the rents and, and the square footages of all the units, but. How do you find that information? Yeah, online, you know, uh, like we visit the property. So we'll go and actually visit these properties. Um, As a potential tenant? Yeah. Super oh, look at you. Okay. Um, and, but a lot of times you'll be able to see like layouts on like apartments.com or, or some of these sites where they have like their rents plus, um, you know, their square footages. And that's just, it's an easy math problem from there. Okay. Cool. And this is the meat and potatoes this is what everyone likes. Um, you know, this is our projected returns uh, for the life of the deal. Again, we kind of touched a lot of these high level ones in the summary slide, uh, but here it's kind of broken down into years. Um, we always use $100,000 increments just for easy math to give you good percentages. So if you invest 50,000, you know kind of what percent of return you're gonna get. Um, but typically we kind of touched on this and I know you asked where your check was, there's typically about a year ramp up time, um, you know, six to 12 months where we typically, you know, it's a balance of raising too much capital because then everyone's returns get, you know, diluted and raising too little where you can't make things work. And so when we start, we have that little bit of CapEx that we use to kind of get things started. Um, for that first six to 12 months, we're actually using, you know, throwing rents, you know, our profits for rents in there to help speed things up. Um, and that, re that reinvestment inside the business really is what helps drive the returns to our investors. So typically year one, we see it lagging. Um, so year one here, we see about 5.3% cash on cash returns um, from there. We see it spiked to 8.5 or 8.6 percent. Year three, we have a refinance scheduled. Um, so, you know, depending on the value that we've increased the rents and where we see the value of the property and what the property is producing, right? We hope to get back, you know, a little bit over half your money um, through that refinance. Again, that's tax free because it's debt, so you can take that money and, and go invest it somewhere else, or you know, and, and kind of double dip with that cash, which is something that we always like. We call it velocity of money. Um, and then because we refinance, right, our debt goes up. So your cash flow kind of drops, but you're getting, you know, that on less than half of your, your investment. So um, that's about 10% cash on cash um, and about 12% cash on cash based off these numbers. Um, and then year six, we sell. And we can see here, your initial $100,000 investment gets you about $236,000 back. Wow. And then here's that question you asked uh, originally, like where does the dollars go, right? And so here we can see what we're raising. So it looks like we raised about 5.5 million. Um, and here's where it goes, right? So 312,000 goes to the acquisition fee. Um, we have working capital of 325,000. We have closing costs of 200,000. And then our down payment is 4.7. And so, you know, we, we, we don't try to hide anything. Everything's in the deck, you can kind of see it. But yeah, this is the capital stack and kind of where that down, where the money that's raised is going. So of that 312, what did you get? Um, I'd have to look. Um, so generally on, speaking, uh, a very small piece, like less than 10%. Okay. Wow. What about the three at the front? Um, they, again, I don't know the hard numbers, but they, at, at minimum, finding the deal and, and doing and getting the financing is around 30% of the, of the GP. So they got at least 30% of that. They earned it. Okay, so, all right. And then the asset management fee, who's that paid to? That's paid to the leads. 
Um, they're the ones that are making sure like they're keeping track of the asset, uh, the property manager. They're keeping track of the flips and the renovations. They're keeping track of all the kind of the business plan items uh, on a month to month basis. Gotcha. So yeah, like me and Scott don't get any piece. You get to be active in that to get that. So that's that's pretty much just the leads. And so did, did this close at a four and a half percent interest rate? Yeah, it did. And we have a rate lock on this one. So that's, yeah, that's, that's good for us. So are you going to, are you going to do the refinance at year three, no matter what, or are you going to look at the numbers and say, let's write it, let's let it ride or what? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it's not for sure at all. Like nothing is for sure. We're going to look at where the property is, what it can sustain, right? It does us no good to refinance and all of a sudden have way too much you know debt and all of a sudden you know we're running at a deficit so um you know we everyone's incentivized to get a refinance and like that's what's cool about these deals is the gps really only get paid if the lps get paid and so you know it's it's going to be a business decision in year three um you know the refi could go as planned um i've seen refis go better than planned you know where we get I, i've had refis that have been over 100 percent um of my initial capital invested so you know looking at like getting all my capital back and a refinance and still hold the asset um and it could be the opposite right where hey like we can get a little bit back like in, you know maybe we get 25 percent of our cash back but the property is going to still pay cash flow and we're going to have a good buffer for our debt service so we know that you know it's still going to perform and, and and hopefully get better there'll be a there'll be a path forward at that point but yeah nothing's for sure Okay. And, and yeah, so that's that's a little bit it. So here's kind of talking on the cap uh, on the tax incentives. Um, looks like we're going to get about sixty, you know, about sixty ninety six percent deduction over the life of the loan, um, and sixty two percent in year one. Um, so hopefully we'll get a nice deduction. And like Scott said, I'll be interested to see how your CPA handles that. Um, but especially if you're classified as real estate professional, you get to write that off your active income, which is pretty pretty powerful tool. Wow. I like that. <clears throat> Pretty solid. All right, what FAQs have we not covered here? Uh oh. Um, I think we've touched most of these. It's not in a floodplain. That's good. Um. So yeah. So profits distributed to investors seventy thirty. So I'm part of that seventy. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And do I get paid eight percent off the top of the gross profit, and then seventy percent of what's left after that? You got it. And so I always like to give this example. So let's say we have twelve percent of profit. Right. You would get the first eight, one hundred percent. That rest of that four, seventy percent goes to you. Thirty percent goes to GP. And so. You, you, you'll always, always have the lion's share of profits. What's in the pipeline? Um, I'll be honest, I've turned down a few deals um, because I didn't like the underwriting because it is such a unique environment. Um, currently, the only active deal I have is an STR fund um, that's going out and, and, and driving additional income through the rents, you know, because you can have... You can produce more income with with vacation rentals, um, and so it still makes more sense. But uh, I really don't have any any hot leads right now. But uh, if you send over me or Scott your you guys' contact information, you know we can make sure you're on the deal flow list. That way, if anything does do come through the pipeline, you guys will be in the know. Um, we do have a vacation uh, rental home owner in the room. So can you talk a little bit more about that STR um, investment that you have going? Yeah, no, it's a fund. Um, so we're, we're trying to raise, I think, about 20 million for this, this first round. Um, I was actually kind of against it in the beginning. Um, I just kind of feel like the space has kind of gotten really hot and kind of where we wanted to go. But, you know, we're working with um, a team called Techvestors. Uh, we have great advisors. We have the the founder of Air DNA on our, our advisory team, so we have some back end data we get to look at. Um, so some of our thesis is we're looking for single family homes less than seven hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, 
um, that's within three hours of a metropolitan area. Um, we call it like class B uh, vacations. And so like a prime example of that is, is like Phoenix, Arizona or Scottsdale or the Poconos up in Pennsylvania. Um, we classify A-class travels like luxury travel, right? You're gonna go international, you go to Maldives, those type of things. B-class travel is gonna be domestic, but you're gonna hop on a plane and fly somewhere, right? So Disneyland, those type of things. And then C-class travel is gonna be something where, you know, you're gonna hop in the car and drive three hours, right? So maybe go to a state park or something like that. And we try to cover BC. And so like something like Phoenix is three hours within LA and San Diego. Um, so as we get into a recession, right, we'll be able to pick up the C-class travel. Um, and if things go good, C-class will go to B-class, right? And we get, to, we get to pick up on that as well. And so that's kind of like where we like to sit or go to these places that have low seasonality, um, good amenities people want to travel and go to. Uh, we have our own design team. We really feel that in the next five years, as the space matures, you're going to see the people that just buy Ikea furniture. And I'm not trying to poke fun. I don't know what your vacation rentals look like, but um, people that just go to Ikea and, and furnish a place and put it on Airbnb, like those days are dwindling. And so all of our, all, all of our vacation rentals have like what we call Instagrammable moments, um, high-end finishes. You know, we have mur murals, murals on the wall, you know, where people take pictures and do things. Um, we really try to make it an experience and have a place where people kind of want to go. And so when they're looking at an area, like ours are going to stand out. Um, I think that's, that's, I mean, I can send you guys the slide deck and look through it. We have a webinar that kind of goes through it, but a lot of data-driven analytics. So like, we'll look at zip codes, we'll look at things and, and say, Hey, like what makes sense here? Like a two bedroom makes sense and a five bedroom makes sense, but like, where do the average daily rates go? And like, does it make sense to buy the two bedroom because it's cheaper or does, it, does the five bedroom make more, enough more that that's where we want to go, right? Type of thing. So it's it's ran by two people. One's an ex-Apple, one's an ex-Facebook employee. And they are just all in the weeds in the tech and it's awesome. Um, you know, the webinar I can I can send over, happily send over, you guys can watch it. They, they, they always knock my socks off and it's kind of cool. So yeah. Um, What's the status of the funding right now? Yep. So we are closing round three at the end of the month in October. Um, and we plan on, well, we're talking about extending it um, just because of the cost of, of creating a new fund. I'll, I want to talk about that in a little, in, in a second, but um, yeah, so we have a round open right now uh, until the end of the month. The cool thing about this is it's only a quarter ramp up before your first distribution. So we talked about like apartment syndications, you're looking at up to a year before you see any kind of cash flow. Um, here, because we're getting in later rounds, um, we have we already have assets that are producing. Um, and so you'll get a distribution about three months after your first investment. So it's a, it's a quicker ramp up to get cash flow. The really cool thing here is it's a five-year business plan. Um, and the space hasn't been like consumed within institutional money. And that's because institutional money wants to park, you know, millions and millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars. And for them to go in and, and look at these individual properties and set them up and, and furnish them and get them up on like a Airbnb or a VRBO, right? It takes them a lot of time and effort to do those minute details. And so they haven't gotten to the space. Um, we've actually had some hedge funds reach out to us already. I think our portfolio is at, at just under 50 units. Um, of, of S, like 50 STRs um, offering us a pretty low cap rate just to buy it from us, right? And so our goal here is to kind of grow it a little bit more. Um, and as we create new funds, like fund one, fund two, fund three, um, combine them. So we can either refinance, right? And banks are willing to give us a better rate if we have a hundred units, you know, diversify with a good business plan, a good, good background. Um, so our rates can be lower. We can get more cash back um, for our investors. Or two, right, lump them all together and sell them to a big check writer, a big hedge fund that's going to pay us a premium because they don't want to go through the, the minute details of like doing research on individual properties or setting them up or doing all that stuff. So it's exciting our exit possibilities for this for this fund as well. What kind of financing do you use for um, uh, it's, it's escaping me. It's, I'm pretty sure it's like SDR loans. So we're just doing like, you know, commercial loans on these properties. Um, but as I say that, I'm pretty sure we have 30 year fixed rates on them. So um, let me get back to you all when I send the email. Um, I'll, I'll make sure to have that answer in for you. Um, 
are you using like local realtors to make the acquisitions in the target markets? So this is, this is like what's called a, like, well, it's, they only want to work with funds. And so I just started a fund to, to invest in the deal. And so I'm purely a capital raiser on this deal. And so I don't know those details on, on who they're working with to, to buy the properties there. Uh, but I can ask that question and get you an answer for sure. Um, so in the fund model, whether it's short-term rental or apartment, you know, I can wrap my head around, I got to share what shares of this apartment complex. I know the exit strategy. Can you talk about the exit strategy or how you take your money out if you are in the fund? Like, is it a minimum amount of time? Can I cash out whenever I want? Yeah, so funds deceiving. Um, it's it's going to be pretty much the same as like investing in a syndication, right? You're locking up your money. Um, the fund should have a business plan. Um, so, you know, like I think you know, for the STR, like staying on that, it's a five-year business plan. And so really you're tied up until that fund sells. So you'll get money back through distributions. You'll get money back. If there's a refi. Um, you'll get money back once it sells, but you're kind of at the mercy of, of the fund on when that happens. Like it's not a liquid asset. It's where but it's not a fund it. into perpetuity. It's a, there's more than one property that's going into this round. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah. So the way it works would be your money, you would, you would wire the money into the fund. The fund would then use that capital to go out and purchase, you know, properties that meet the underwriting criteria. Um, and as they purchase properties, right, they're putting it into the fund. So you're getting a small proportion of all the assets in the fund. You're not getting just ownership of one short-term rental in the fund. You're kind of getting a, a broad, you know, brush of all of them. So if I were to buy into the short-term rental fund round three, I'm buying a different 50 houses than one and two. No, and that, you know, you're buying, you, when you buy in, you're pretty much diluting, right? Like the people that have already invested, uh, but they've already, they've already got their distributions for the money they have in the cap in the deal, right? We're, so year one's a ramp period. So as new money comes in, we're, we go out and try to buy those properties. And the reason you get distribution so quickly is because you just, you get share of everything that has been purchased and is performing plus everything that's going to come online after you. And so it's, it's all one entity. So think about, um, think about it as a business, like you bought shares of a business and that business is trying to grow. And so as you put money in, you not only get the established business, but you get all the growth that comes after it as well. Is that still not clear? No, it, it's a slightly opaque, but I had a LASIK, so it's cool. I can see it. That's bad on me if I can't explain it, but. But yeah, no, you would get you would get ownership of everything that's in that fund from beginning to end if you invested in it, proportionate to the amount you put in. Okay. Well, any uh, closing questions for Mitch? How did you get into this, Mitch? Yeah. Um, so I actually have 13 properties in Indianapolis. Well, 13 units. Uh, some some breakdown of properties in Indianapolis um, as rentals, long term rentals. They still hold them. Um, and really, like I, I don't call it a sob story, but I wasn't raised with very much, um, and I always had a drive to like just make money, right? To to be financially free. And uh, so I, I saw real estate as a great path for that. I think a lot of us in the room probably understand, you know, why I went down that path. Found bigger pockets, read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Really understood that trading time for money wasn't for me. Um, <laughs> Well, after I got my portfolio of properties, like, like Scott said, it became a job, right? I kind of got worn down. I was like, I don't see this being scalable. This isn't going to get me where I want to be. And I always tell the joke of like, you know, growing up, I always wanted financial independence, but it quickly changed the financial and time independence. Um, and then, you know, I just look for a better, better way to do what I'm doing. And syndications really crossed that, you know, like was that intersection where I was like, wow, it's still real estate. I get all the benefits of real estate, all the tax advantages. Uh, you know, everything that goes into it, but it's also something that like is infinitely scalable, right? Because I can just put my money there and I don't really have to do anything, right? Like I'm try after I do my due diligence on the team and then deal, you know, I get to sit back and just collect checks. And like, I'm never getting phone calls about tenants. I'm not getting phone calls about toilets or anything like that. It's just something that I saw was the way I wanted to go. And so once I made that determination, I invested as an LP 
And then from there, I was like, well, how do I get active? And so that's how I got on the active side as well. So what's your job title? Um, like you feel like look at my LinkedIn, you mean? Uh, yeah. What do you, yeah. What's your occupation? What's your job title? Yeah. So I've, I've been in software consulting for almost 10 years. Um, I still consult on that. So I, I work about four to eight hours a week, you know, as a, as an IT consultant. Um, but when people ask what I do, I, I tell them that, you know, I invest in real estate. And so I guess I, I would call myself an investor. Cool. Well, it's two o'clock. Uh, we start on time, end on time. So thank you so much for bailing out Scott, who was really supposed <laughs> to talk the whole time, but we really got Scott, better Scott and, and, and that was Mitch. So thank you for Good answering job, all man. the tough questions. Yeah. I hope it was useful and beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you want to send me anything on our um, Doug Scott Mitch uh, reply all, then I'll forward everything on uh, anything that you decide to share. Um, I'll pass on to the group. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Thank all right, you, thank you. Cheers. Bye.